Is Todd does is he out there in the main when when there is if he's, he's out there in the hallway well, maybe he can drop that door open or something while he's in the I don't want to I don't want it open while they're not there but, yeah I'll um, send him some leads I can't think of I don't have a solution for that no they probably tweak the pipes and put the air in here and then let that form. Oh, well, it's supposed to cool off this uh, the rest of the week. So, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you, may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 people versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Um, prosecution, call your next witness. Uh, Your Honor, the next witness is John Watney. Last name again? John Watney. Watney. All right, Mr. Watton, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. You swear from the testimony about to give this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Ms. Gratiano. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Maybe you can settle debate for us. Uh, can you state your last name, your first name and your last name for the record? John Wadden. Thank you. Uh, and where are you employed? Avis Budget Group. And uh, under the umbrella of Avis, what does Avis do? So Avis is one of the premier rental car brands. You may be familiar with Avis Rent-A-Car, Budget Rent-A-Car, Zipcar, Payless Rent-A-Car. Um, and also budget truck rentals. And when we're talking about rentals uh, specific to budget, what kind of uh, rentals are we talking about? Can you be a little bit more specific? Let's... Um, well, I can probably help you out there. Um, before you is People's Exhibit 239. It'll be on your right-hand side. It's previously admitted, Your Honor. Are you wanting to... I'm just going to have him look at it. Okay. Um, can you take a look at People's Exhibit 239 there? I have 240155. You're under permission, yeah. permission to approach? Yeah. There's a lot of numbers on here. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. So here, uh, lower right, okay. this will be 239, but. Um, okay. This is a budget truck rental contract. Okay. And so that particular asset uh, is what again? It's a budget truck rental contract. Okay. And each asset, if you will, a truck that budget would, rep, uh, would rent out, is there a particular identifier number that is assigned to a vehicle? Yes. Each truck is uh, six digits in length. Okay. And it's... Uh, all numbers. All right. Yeah. In front of you, People's Exhibit 239, can you tell what vehicle number budget assigned that particular asset? Truck number 911739. Okay. And in terms of what you do with budget, can you explain budget and the many other entities that are in the Avis company? What is your role? Sure, so I'm the corporate security manager. And how long have you been in that role? And I've been in this role for two years as a corporate security manager, but I've been with Avis Budget for 26 years. Did you wear different hats? Yes, many, many different hats. Okay. I've been in the security function role for the last 10 years. All right. 
And in terms of what, for example, specific to budget, what that entity does um, with regard to tracking, locating, protecting its assets, specifically rental trucks, what kind of resources do you have there? Uh, we, we have GPS devices that we use on our vehicles. Um, not that we want to track every rental customer, because we don't do that, right? But if we have a vehicle that is missing, abandoned, or it's reported stolen, then we would want to use our GPS devices to try to locate that vehicle. Okay. And in terms of access that you have to that information, is that part of your job role and responsibility? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, your Honor, permission to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibit 292. You may go ahead. I'll ask you to take a moment to familiarize yourself with People's Exhibit 292. I'm fine. Do you generally recognize what that is? Yes, I do. What is it? it, it this is a report that um, when I want to track a vehicle, I go onto a website who's our partner which is a company called Air IQ. And I have the ability to track cars and trucks through this system. Um, I can do live searches for a vehicle and I can also receive historical information on a vehicle. And um, with the relationship with partnership we have with the company, our service plan, we receive four historical pings every day. So if I'm not looking for a vehicle, I receive a historical ping. One at six o'clock in the morning, one at noon, one at midnight. Um, sorry, one at 6 p.m. and one at, one at midnight. Um, this report is showing those historical pings. And there's also an additional GPS ping or hit on the vehicle, which is called a power up. And that is just a health check from the company, from Air IQ, reaching out to its GPS device to make sure that it's working. And in terms of the number of pages, uh, there's a number of pages in front of you there. Do those pages accurately represent the GPS information, historical information that you were able to pull from that particular asset? I counted a total of 12 pages. That's this is what I pulled per the production order uh, of records that I was asked to produce. This is what I pulled 12 pages. All right. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move to admit People's Exhibit 292. Yes. Exhibit 292 will be admitted. Go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, you explained that. Uh, there's an asset number that's associated with the rental agreement um, that you just looked at, People's Exhibit 239. I'll have that projected behind you. And just so the jury can see uh, what you were reading off of, you talked about uh, vehicle information, a vehicle identification number that budgets assigned to this particular truck. Uh, can you point to the jury where that appears uh, on the screen behind you? This right here is the truck number, 911739. Great. And you're on a permission to publish People's Exhibit 292 as well. You may, go ahead. And um, just give us a second, uh, Mr. Watton, we're going to project behind you People's Exhibit 292, and it will be the first page uh, of those 12. Great. 
So it's it's small, but uh, we'll we'll be able to focus in there um, as we move forward. And so that particular printout also identifies the particular vehicle identification number as well. What would that number be? This is the truck number, 911739. This is the license plate number on the truck. Okay. And as far as that uh, identification number that uh, budget assigns are those two numbers in People's Exhibit 292 and 249. Are those the same numbers? Yes. Okay, great. Um, now we will ask to try to zoom in if we can, because the numbers are pretty small up on that screen right now. Thank you. Now you gave us some information about historical information. So when you received a request for document production, um, you're given specific date range to pull from? On the production order for records, I was asked to turn over any documents that related with the defendant's name. Okay. And so when we look at um, People's Exhibit 292, um, I'd ask you to look at the first line. You explain that there is a power up function for that GPS monitoring. And that first line, uh, what is that representing? So this is the date and the time of the power up. So the power up. Great. And you'd explain that there are particular uh, time intervals for which a historical ping is sent. How often are the power ups occurring? The power ups occur every 25 hours. Okay. And as we look at uh, lines one through 13. Uh, I'd ask you to look, the, look at the location data for lines one through 13, and are those all the same location? Those are all the same location. Okay. And while you may not be familiar with Colorado Springs, are you generally familiar with what that address represents as it relates to budget? That is one of our budget truck locations. Okay. And so the last, uh, let's see, look at line 13. What type of data point is that GPS tracker pulling? Is it a power up? Is it a scheduled inventory alert? So line 13 at six o'clock in the morning, six ten in the morning. Okay. It's scheduled. It's one of the scheduled inventory alerts that occur every six hours. So six a.m., twelve noon, six p.m., and midnight. Yes. Perfect. Um, by the next line, line fourteen. What time are we at there? We are at 12 p.m. Okay. And to be clear, what day uh, are we now on? We are on 2-1. February 1st of 2020? Yes. Okay. And so by 12, 10 uh, p.m., to be clear, is there a particular time that budget uh, GPS is tracking this time as for frame of reference? Is it in Easter time? Is it in mountain time? You can schedule a time to whatever time you want it to be. Mm -hmm. I'm stationed, I, I live in the East Coast, so I set it up for an East Coast time. Okay. But I have to be aware that it could be a different time. So in terms of, as we walk through this data and we talk about particular times that we see here, this would be all related to Eastern time, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And so if the vehicle uh, remains in Colorado for a period of time, we might have to do subtraction there. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Okay. And subtraction, sorry, subtraction of about how much time? Two hours. Two hours. Okay. So we'll try to keep that in mind as we go through. And so when we look at uh, the time of uh, line 14 on February 1st of 2020, the timestamp there is going to reflect 1210, but what time would that be? in Mountain Standard Time? That would be, um, that would be uh, 10, 10 p.m., yeah. 10 a.m.? Yeah. You said 12 p.m. Oh. So 12 noon, for, for example? Two, then that would be 10 a.m., yeah. Great. And what location um, was the vehicle at at 10 a.m. Colorado time? It's hard to. Yeah, sorry. 
So on the 14th yes. at 10 a.m., it was at, um, it says Love's Pueblo. So that would be a Love's truck stop. Okay. And the next scheduled inventory alert would be line 15. Yes. And again, we'll have to do a little math, but what time would that be in Colorado time for line that, 15? That would be uh, line 15. Yes, sir. So that would be, um, that would be 4 p.m. And where is the vehicle at that point? On US 87, Dalhart, Texas. Okay. The next scheduled uh, ping occurred on line 16. Um, what day would we be at now? That would be a 10 p.m. Okay. And while the line 16 reflects February 2nd. That's correct. At 12, 10 a.m. in terms of Colorado. Um, at this point, the vehicle's in Texas. That's correct. 18 Western Plaza Drive. Okay. <clears throat> there is a power up that occurs, a regular power up at the 25th hour. Uh, what location um, for line 17 does that vehicle appear at? Again, it would be 18 West Plaza Drive, same as the prior. Okay. And is that still in Amarillo, Texas? That's correct. Okay. As we move forward, uh, what is the last time stamp um, that vehicle remains at 18 Western Plaza Drive, Amarillo, Texas? The timestamp would be on this report, it'd be 2220 at, at 12 p.m. So that would be uh, 10 a.m. For the next uh, location data point, where, uh, what time would we be at for that? Uh, line 20. Line 20 would be uh, 4 p.m., 4, 10 p.m., exactly, in Bellevue, Texas, 601 U.S. Highway 287. Okay. And in line 21, uh, what time and what day would we be at now for the next ping? That would be at um, the the date here is two three twenty, but it would actually be two two twenty, and it would be at ten p.m. Okay, and the location, what state? Six hundred one West Thompson Street in Decatur, Texas. Okay. Now uh, the next line, line twenty two, is one of those power ups that you explained happens on the twenty fifth hour. At this point, uh, what timestamp and what day is that power up occurring at? The day would be 2-3-20, and the time would be 2-14 a.m., and the location would be the same as the prior location, 601 West Thompson Street, Decatur, Texas. Okay. Now, as we move forward, the next would be just one of those scheduled inventory alert pings, line 23? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what time is that occurring at? That's at 4 a.m. on 2-3-20 and at the exact same location as the prior two pings at 601 West Thompson Street, Decatur, Texas. Okay. In fact, line 24, uh, can you tell whether or not the vehicle is now moved? Yes, and so at that time, which it says 2320, which says 12 p.m., it would actually be 10 a.m. Central Time Zone. The location is 1705 South FM 150 or 51 Decatur, Texas. But if you if you move over to the right of the report, you can see that the vehicle is not stopped. It's actually moving 29 kilometers per hour at this time. Okay. Uh, now line 25 um, on February 3rd of 2020. Uh, what time did that inventory alert go again? February 3rd, 2020, it, it, the report has 6 p.m. There would be 4, 10 p.m. And the location was on I-20, Ruston, Louisiana. And, and line 20, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I didn't know if you, it, it's, it's moving at 115 kilometers per hour. So the vehicle's in motion by the time that particular timestamp is being recorded? That's correct. Right. Uh, we'll go to... Line 26. 2420. So now we moved on to the 
well, if we're, if we're counting for the time difference, that's right. what day are we really talking about? So 2, 3, 20 at 10 p.m., 10, 10 p.m. And the location of the vehicle at that point? 29451 U.S. Highway 98, Dauphin, Alabama. And you'd, you'd mentioned before, but can you tell if the vehicle's in motion at this point? Yes, it's in motion, 40 kilometers an hour. Okay. Line 27 uh, is one of those power-up moments as you explained on the 25th hour, what date and time did this occur at? 2 4 20, uh, the report has 5 15, it's at uh, 3 15 a.m. And the address is 9400 University Parkway, Ferry Pass, Florida. Now, in terms of uh, the location now being in Florida, would the timestamp of 5 15 a.m. be consistent with Eastern time? Or are you having to make an that's an accounting of that, would it, or would we now be in the appropriate time zone? That would now be at the appropriate time, right? Since it's on East Coast time, that's correct. Okay. And while I'm not good with Alabama, would the would the time have changed yet? Would we have crossed over at that point? I, I, <laughs> You're not an expert in, no, I, in time zones? It could have changed over at Alabama, but... <laughs> that's fair. Uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on that. All right. Uh, in terms of uh, the next data points that we see, when we when it is scheduled at that power up on February 4th at 5.15 a.m., can you tell if the vehicle is moving or not? The vehicle is stopped. And at the next scheduled time point, line 28, where is the vehicle? 2420, 10 a.m., 8080 North davis highway in ferry pass florida okay and the position is the is the vehicle moving or not the vehicle is stopped okay at the next ping uh, february 4th of 2020 uh, what time stamp would that be on line 29 time stamp 12 10 p.m and again same location as the prior 8080 north davis highway ferry pass florida and the vehicle is stopped. Okay. The next time ping that is recorded on line 30 on February 4th, uh, what timestamp is that? 6, 10 p.m. on the 4th. Where's the vehicle at that point? 818 Church Hill Way, Southwest in Lake City, Florida. And is the vehicle in motion at that point? The vehicle is in motion at 119 kilometers per hour. On February 5th, now we've moved on to the next day, but we're in the right uh, same time zone, so we don't have to make any uh, subtraction calculations in our head. But on February 5th at um, 12, 10 a.m., where is the vehicle? The vehicle is at 13028 Plantation Park Circle, and it's in uh, Lake Buena Vista, Florida. Is the vehicle moving or stopped? The vehicle is stopped. At the next timestamp, same day, but now at 6, 10 a.m., where's the vehicle? At the exact same location in Lake Buena Vista, Florida, 13028 Plantation Park Circle, and the vehicle is stopped. Okay. At the next scheduled um, inventory alert ping, has the vehicle moved locations yet? No, it has not. We talked about that power up moment on the 25th hour, even at that point, is the vehicle still in that same uh, location in Lake Buena Vista, Florida? That is correct. Okay. In fact, um, the first time that we see the vehicle moving the address, would that have been on uh, line 36 on February 6th of 2020? That is correct. Uh, line 36 at 12, a, 10, 12, 10 a.m. The vehicle is moving 119 kilometers per hour. It's on 235 I-95 in Pooler, Georgia. Okay. On line 37, same day, February 6th of 2020 at 6, 10 a.m. Where is the vehicle now? The address comes up as Days Inn and Forest Brook, South Carolina, and the vehicle is stopped. And at the next uh, GPS ping for that power up moment on the 25th hour, is that vehicle moved that location? No, the vehicle is at the exact same location stopped. Okay. On line 39, 
February 6th of 2020 at 12 10 p.m. Where is the vehicle now? The vehicle is 2246 Highway 501 East in Conway, South Carolina. And it's traveling very slow, 7.2 kilometers per hour. Okay. The next location data of the GPS is pushed out is that same day, but now at 6, 10 p.m. Where is the vehicle at that time? 1400 Cannon Road in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and the vehicle is stopped. And as you move forward um, past lines 40, through say 66, does the vehicle remain at the same location? It does, yes it does. And uh, line 40, we would have been on February 6th of 2020 and line 66, where it still hasn't moved, what date are we now at? February 12th, 2020. Line 68 on February 12th of 2020 at 12, 10 p.m. Where is the vehicle located? Homestown Road, Garden City, South Carolina. The vehicle's moving 97 kilometers per hour. Okay. Fair to say the rest of the page um, for people's uh, 292, uh, lines 68 through 89, are those various locations throughout South Carolina? That is correct. And in terms of what you've produced, can you tell when the vehicle was returned uh, specifically to any location in South Carolina? Yes, the, the 1400 Cannon Road is one of our budget truck locations. And you can see that the vehicle returned to that location. It was there for an extended period of time, which would also match up with the first document produced today on the rental contract, because the rental was from February 1st to February 6th. So you have the truck in Colorado at the budget truck location. It flows through the US and then it ends up in South Carolina, which would mirror the rental contract. Okay. And I'll just ask you to, um, just just to, to double check the date of the reservation, um, is that consistent with February 6th or February 5th of 2020? Might be difficult to read. It, it was due in on the 5th, but it wasn't show up to the 6th at the okay. location. Okay. Fair to say that the vehicle remained at that budget location for a number of those GPS time points. Specifically, you pointed out from February 6th through a number of other pages and lines that we haven't gone through. Is that fair? That, Past February 12th? Absolutely. Okay. That's fair. So the vehicle being returned at that location, is this going to tell you who then used the vehicle after that? No. Okay. There are a number of other GPS data points that that car is still tracking after February 12th of 2020. Is that true? That is correct. Okay. Ultimately, where does the car end up at? On this report, the car ends up in Rhode Island. Okay. And would have ended up at Rhode Island at another store location. That's correct. Okay. And so what we've reviewed a number of data points, is that all produced through historica, historical data pool that you did? That's correct. I, I go onto the website and I pull the historical report and this is my findings on the historical findings report. And so uh, you've never been a resident of Texas, I'm assuming? No, I have not. Okay. Um, so we went through a number of time points, but in terms of calculation, uh, if Texas was in a central time zone, which is 
uh, basically an hour difference from Eastern time. Uh, would all of those times have been adjusted really through Texas and say Alabama for an hour? An hour difference from what that's was That's correct, absolutely. Yep. Okay, fair to say you're, you're more familiar with the East Coast time? Yes, I am, ma'am. Okay, and in terms of, again, monitoring this information, to be clear, you weren't sitting at a computer tracking each of these data points, is that right? Absolutely not. In terms of the data points, is that something that you um, or other people that manage assets within budget would then use to track down vehicles? Correct. There was, it would be myself and our loss prevention team, which at the time would be four other individuals. So there would be five total in our department that would have access to achieve to, to, to pull these data points. Okay. And in terms of uh, then pulling those data points and as far as then potentially mapping those data points clearly with addresses there, is that something that somebody else can then do if they have addresses? If you have the, the access to the website, you can pull this historical data, yes. Okay. And you could potentially map those addresses and track somebody's movements in a vehicle. You, you could, yes, absolutely. Okay. And while I'm also not familiar with the transitioning between time zones, um, if, if you understood that Pensacola, Florida was also in a central time zone, would that be, would that sound about right? If it, I, I, if it is, I'm just, I'm used to the East Coast time zone, but I. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. And to be clear, when we refer to the various time points um, that may be around Pensacola, Florida, or in the Florida area, that would be an important um, distinction to make depending on the address where it flies, uh, where it sits in that split of the time zone. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Chair, we'll pass the witness. Cross examination. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Mr. Wadley? No. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Give that to the court reporter, please. Thank you, sir. Prosecution, Clean it, which is please. We would call John Grassel to the stand, Your Honor. Mr. Grassel, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. a little closer. Everybody does that. That's okay. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, Mr. Grassel. How are you doing? Good afternoon, sir. Could you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record? Uh, my name is John Grassel, G-R-A-S-S. E L. And do you have an occupation at this time? Yes. What is that? I am a uh, senior manager at uh, Research Triangle Institute, which is a uh, research company based in North Carolina. And did you uh, retire from a law enforcement agency? Yes, I am a retired uh, detective lieutenant from the Rhode Island State Police. What the heck is someone from Rhode Island doing in Colorado testifying in a murder case? We're going to get there. Um, were you working for the Rhode Island, um, was it state police back yes. in uh, January of 2020? Yes. And did you have an occasion to perform a uh, analysis on a budget rental car truck that's related to this case? back on March 26th of 2020? Yes. What did you know prior to doing uh, a search and examination of this vehicle about 
this, this case? Uh, I was given a uh, signed search warrant on the 30th of March, 2020, which gave some details uh, in reference to this case. And what, what were the details that you remember? Uh, the details uh, were of a uh, reported crime and of the vehicle, uh, the, this vehicle, Ford uh, van that was used uh, to transport uh, a body for a crime. And then the van ended up into uh, Rhode Island. It was a rental van. And so prior to looking at this vehicle and searching it pursuant to the warrant, what were you going in looking for, if anything? Pursuant to the warrant? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we would document the vehicle first uh, with photographs and examine it uh, for any any evidence, uh, such as uh, touch DNA, um, evidence of blood, evidence of uh, bodily fluid, uh, and, and anything that was still contained within the rental vehicle. I may approach witness, Your Honor. I'm sorry? May I approach the witness? You may. Go ahead. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as People's Exhibits 294 through 309. If you could just take a moment to take a look at those, uh, and then I'll ask you some follow up questions. Have you had a chance to do that? Yes, sir. And what are those photographs of? Uh, the beginning photos are overall photographs of the exterior and interior of the uh, van that was searched. And then the photographs uh, subsequently show some evidence that was uh, seized from the van. And then uh, the last photographs show a cutting from a, a, a floor mat from inside the van. And then um, the very last photograph is, uh, it's, it's a, a photograph of a chemical reaction uh, from a chemical that we applied to that floor mat. Do people's exhibits 294 through 309 accurately depict the van as it looked back in March of, March 26 of 2020, when you were searching that van and, and doing the swabs that we talked about and doing the CSI effect on the van? Yes, they do. Uh, we would move to admit people's exhibits uh, 294 through 309. No. Exhibits 294 through 309 will be admitted. Go ahead. Before we show those pictures, um, did you uh, dictate a report or create a report as a result of your search? Yes. And in that report, did you indicate all the areas where you did swabs? Yes. What's a swab, and could you kind of briefly talk about the areas of the van that you swabbed? So uh, a swab, we in this case, we were, uh, for the swabs, we were looking for uh, touch DNA. Uh, so we swabbed the, there's, uh, this van has a, front, a driver's door, passenger door, a side door, which is on the passenger side that, swing, that slides open, and then a rear door. So for each of those doors, we took a swab. Uh, so uh, it's just a cotton swab and you put distilled water on it and you take a swab of the exterior of the handle and then the interior of the handle. And that uh, could potentially uh, lead to a DNA uh, result if someone was to touch it. So that's the purpose of those swabs. Then we took additional swabs of the steering wheel, the turn signal, uh, the glove box, uh, container as well. And you don't actually conduct the DNA analysis when you're doing the swabs. You, what do you, what do you do with the swab once you conduct a swab, for instance, of a door handle? Yeah. So each, uh, swab is put into its individual swab box and a, uh, evidence number is taken for each individual swab. And then that is sent, uh, well, in this case it was sent to Colorado, but normally it would be sent to whatever lab is processing it for DNA. So I wanna to go to the photos now. We can start with People's Exhibit 294.
slow in Colorado. We'll get up there and such okay. stuff. <laughs> While we're doing that, um, did you indicate the VIN number of this particular van uh, that you were searching back on March 26th? I, I did in my report. And with that, I'm sure you don't have it memorized, right? Not at all. Do you have your report with you? I do not. Okay, can I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. If this is page 5172 for counsel. Now I'll direct your attention to the bottom uh, paragraph of your report. Do you annotate the VIN number for the van that you searched? Yes. Could you just tell us what that is? 1-F-T-Y-E. Two C M seven K K B three two six six seven. Okay, thanks. I can retrieve the report now. All right, now we've got people's exhibit two ninety four up there. Uh, can you tell the jury what two ninety four shows? This is the front of the uh, vehicle that we uh, searched and processed. This uh, vehicle is inside of the uh, vehicle examination bay at the Rhode Island State Police Headquarters. We can go to 295, please. What do we see in 295? Uh, this is the interior of the vehicle, and it's the uh, showing, uh, mostly showing the, pass the front passenger side with the uh, door open. Are these the only two seats in that vehicle? Yes. Uh, 296. What do we see in 296? 296 is uh, this is a divider that separates the uh, occupant area from the cargo area of the van. And it, there are, are those holes within that divider? Yes. Is there access to get to the back from the driver's cab area through those dividers? Do they open? Yes. Uh, is it a door or what is it? It's a, it's a door. We can go to 297 now. What do we see in 297? Uh, this is the view from the, uh, the, uh, the, the slider door is open on the passenger side. And so the photograph shows the, the view of the rear, uh, interior rear of the van. Uh, and then at the back of the photograph, uh, the two um, doors, the two rear doors, which are closed. And what kind of material is the bottom area of this cab area that we see here? It's like a thick rubber. 298? What do we see in 298? Uh, so we're inside of the van now, uh, and this photograph is showing the rear doors, which are closed. So it's uh, inside looking towards the back of the van. Are there any windows in the cargo area of this van? No. You can go to 290. Nine now, what do we see in 299? Uh, this photograph was taken with the rear doors open, uh, facing towards the front of the van, uh, the separated divider between the cargo portion and the, uh, the occupant portion. Are those the doors you alluded to earlier that we see in the center of the picture? The yes, that's the uh, that that's how you can access the the cargo part of the van from the, the passenger pod. Okay. And does those doors open from both sides or do you know? I'm not certain. Okay. We can go to 300. What do we see in 300? 300 is a uh, angle. Uh, the photograph is angled to show um, the majority of that floor section in the rear of the van. 301. <laughs> What do we see in 301? Uh, so 301 is from inside of the van um, facing the cargo doors, which lead to the passenger side. Can we zoom in on that handle to see what, we, what it looks like? So can you describe the, the handle to these cargo doors? Uh, it's, like a, it's, it's, it's like a little latch. Uh, so you can, op uh, it just opens. Um, Do you know whether or not there's a latch on the other side? There is. Yeah, it's a handle on the other side. All right. We go to 302 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 302? Uh, so 302 is a 
a close up of a um, like an animal toy that was underneath the front passenger seat. And we see a placard there with the number fourteen. Can you tell the jury what that is? Uh, so the each each time the ev uh, evidence was taken from the vehicle, we we took a uh, a number. So uh, placard fourteen represents it's this is evidence number fourteen. We can go to three o three now. What do we see in three o three? We took the dog toy uh, out from underneath the seat because you couldn't really. Uh, see it well in the photograph. Uh, so this is the dog toy uh, up next to the placard. And did you collect that? Um, looks yeah. like a dog bone or something, a rubber dog yeah, bone? It's like a rubber dog toy bone. Okay. We can go to People's Exhibit 304. What do we see in 304? Uh, 304 is the inside of the glove box, which is um, right in front of the, the front passenger seat. And did you collect a Verizon phone calling card from this glove box? Yes. Using People's Exhibit 304, there's a pointer up there somewhere. It's old school pointer. It's like a red handle to your left. Oh, yeah. There you go. Can you point out if we can see uh, part of the Verizon calling card in this photograph? A pointer. Uh, <laughs> you're not the first one. Uh... Thanks. We can go to 305. Now, what do we see in 305? Uh, 305 is the, the front side of that um, Verizon uh, prepaid uh, like phone card. And again, this would be placard 16? Yes. And is that correlated in your report when you're discussing evidentiary items? Yes. Okay. If we can go to 306, what do we see in 306? Uh, the, 306 is the rear side of that uh, Verizon uh, phone card. And does it have identifying information with regards to that phone card where someone may be able to go back and track that phone card to a particular phone? Yes. Did you do that? I did not. Were you asked to do that? No. Okay. Now, you mentioned um, applying some chemical to the back of the van. Why did you do that, and what was the chemical device used for? Uh, so there were numerous stains that we uh, noted throughout the interior of the van, uh, and to include the rear of the van. Uh, and so in this particular one, um, we used uh, two different chemicals. Uh, we used Hema 6, and we used uh, Blue Star. Let's talk about Blue Star. What is Blue Star designed to do? A blue star is a uh, presumptive test for blood. Uh, so it reacts, uh, causes a reaction if there are blood, but it's not, it's a presumptive test, so it may not be blood, but it would react and it causes the color change. And is that used in your prior field, for instance, to see whether or not areas of the van should be swabbed to look to see if it is actually blood? Yes. And is that one of the reasons why you might apply the blue star is to perhaps you can't see certain items with the naked eye and this will help enhance that? Correct. Yeah. So what kind of chemicals is the blue star designed to pull? Uh, so the, the blue star reacts with, uh, it's the lead portion of uh, the heme or, or um, part of the hemoglobin in, inside of blood or iron. I'm sorry, iron, not, not lead. And so when you apply that, what do you see if, for instance, there's something that may be blood? Uh, so you, it is a color change, which goes to a bluish color. And are you able to photograph that and capture that? Yes. Why don't we go to People's Exhibit 307 now? So what do we see in People's Exhibit 307? Uh, we had... Uh, cut a portion of the uh, the rear floor mat out uh, and, subsequent to testing. And it, it, why did you cut this portion out? Uh, areas of this portion uh, we noted had a, a colored reaction, so a positive uh, reaction uh, with when Blue Star was applied. And so just for context, in People's Exhibit 307, 
What are we seeing here? What area of this rubber mat that you described earlier are we talking about in the cargo area? So it, it would be the area directly behind where the driver is extending to um, over halfway um, uh, towards where the passenger would sit and then towards the rear of the vehicle. We can go to 308 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 308? Uh, so, so 308 is the uh, the cutout section, and you could um, it's it's discolored because that uh, the darker portion is still wet from where we apply the blue star. And you label that with placard 17. Yes. Now, did you uh, or someone from your agency ship this to Colorado for further analysis? Yes. Why don't we go to People's Exhibit 309 now? What are we seeing in People's Exhibit 309? Uh, three is, 309 is some of that uh, color change that's noted uh, when the blue star was applied to the mat um, in the rear of the cargo area. And so is this the area that we just talked about that you cut out based on, uh, I, I assume, this photograph? Yes. And is that what blue star would react to for a presumptive or iron or blood? Yes. Did you also send the Verizon card and this rubber dog bone to Colorado as well? Yes. You have a moment, Your Honor? You may. Those are my questions. Thanks. Cross examination. Anything else, sir? Good, sir. How was your trip? It was fine. Thank you. It was fine. Did you get in last night or today? I got in uh, uh, yesterday. Yesterday? Okay. So, do you know how this van, do you know how to get to Rhode Island? Uh, I'm not sure how it got to Rhode Island. Um, I know it was uh, seized, uh, how it got to my agency. Sure, but you don't know how it got from South Carolina to Rhode Island? I, I do not. Do you know how many people had rented that van um, in between when it was dropped off in South Carolina and when between you looked at it? No. And you guys are kind of, a, you guys are assisting. Um, some other agencies in this investigation. Yes. Um, I mean, there was nothing to indicate that any of this crime took place in the state of Rhode Island. That's correct. And you basically got a call from the FBI asking if you guys could help out. That's correct. And one thing, because it was in Rhode Island, then you guys had to do a search warrant to a Rhode Island judge. Yes. Did you uh, assist in doing that search warrant, or was that done by somebody else? That's That was done by uh, someone else. Okay. Did you review that search warrant? No. Okay. Um, and then as whether or not there was blood or whatever in that van and whose blood that might have been, that wasn't something for you to figure out. That was then, let me rephrase it. That was a bad question. To see if that was blood or whose blood that might have been, what you did, you shipped that off to Colorado and let them, so they can run whatever test to make that determination. That's correct. You right now have no idea if that actually was blood or whose blood that might have been. That's correct. No further questions. Your right. Oh, thank you. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Mr. Gressel? All right. Thank you, sir. You may uh, sure. step down. Watch your step. You step down. Counsel, if you would retrieve the exhibits for the court reporter, please. I will do that. Thanks. And prosecution, call your next witness, please. Your Honor, Catherine Beckel. Ms. Bethel, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, ma'am. Okay. You swear from the testimony about to give this man be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Good afternoon. Hi. Would you state your name for the record? Uh, Catherine Beckel. And in... 2020, February of 2020, January of 2020, where did you work? I was a dispatcher at the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. And how long were you a dispatcher for? At that point in time, uh, approximately two years. And in terms of the role of a dispatcher, can you explain generally what a dispatcher does to the jury? Yeah. Um, as a dispatcher, we handle all 
the incoming 911 and non-emergent calls, um, gather all necessary information for that call, and then dispatch out the appropriate response, whether that be law, fire, or medical. And in terms of um, distinguishing between uh, emergency calls versus non-emergency calls, uh, how did that process work? Um, well, normally the the not or the emergency calls would come in on nine one one. Given the information that we receive, would kind of classify if that was an emergency or not, um, whether that did need an immediate response. We'd handle everything on nine one one for the most part, um, unless it needed kind of a lengthier phone call. So if a person calls into 911 and the dispatcher determines that it's really a non-emergent call, what do you do? We tell them to call back on the non-emergent number. That way we're not tying up a 911 line um, and still get them the help that they need, but without tying up the line for people that did have an emergency. And you give them particular uh, non-emergent telephone number to the caller? Correct, yeah, we always get that to them. In terms of then also triaging calls, how is a call placed into 911? How is that call categorized? Where does that information come from? So it's based on the information that we receive, um, what the caller is stating is going on. And then we put it in our call screens, um, a length or a lot of different call types that it could be and based on those call types is what decides the priority of the call so it's all kind of set in our computer system okay and in terms of uh, being on duty on february 27th of 2020 uh, were you working that day yes i was you're on a permission approach with what has been marked as people's exhibit 208 and 209 may go ahead Ms. Beckel, if you can take a moment to familiarize yourself with People's Exhibit 208 and 209. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? Um, from authenticating the call. Okay, and uh, we'll start with People's Exhibit 208. What is that? Did you have an opportunity to review uh, what was on People's Exhibit 208. Yes, yes, I did. That was the original 911 call that was placed first. Okay. And People's Exhibit 209, what is that? That is the non emergent call from when we told the caller to call back on the non emergent line. Okay. And to be clear, um, are you the call taker, or sorry, the dispatcher that's receiving both calls? No, I received the non emergent um, call. Another dispatcher took the original 911 call. Okay, and you explained that as a receiving information that comes through on that emergency line, uh, certain bits of information um, taken via the caller and asked the dispatcher asked that person for some basic information. Is that right? Yes. And so some of that basic information would that also include asking the caller to identify themselves? Yes. Okay. So in People's Exhibit two hundred and eight, when you listen to that, uh, was there an identification made in two? People's 200, uh, 208 and yes. 209 that are the same name as yes. the caller. And when you listen to People's Exhibit 208 and 209, uh, do you recognize the person who's calling into those lines? Do you recognize that voice? I'm sorry, do I recognize it like personally or from the? Well, when you listed Exhibit 209, you said that that was a call that you were on. And when you listen to that call in relation to uh, exhibit 208, is the caller calling into those lines? Does that appear to be the same voice when you listen to both of those exhibits? Yes, it is. Okay. And in terms, again, as you've testified, the person calling in identified as the same name for both calls? Yes. And what was the name that that caller identified in both exhibit 208 and 209? Uh, Tisha. Last name? Oh. Thank you. Uh, and People's Exhibit 208 and 209, is that an accurate representation uh, of the calls that were placed to the emergent line and the non-emergent line? Yes, it is. 
Your Honor, at this time, we would move for admission of People's Exhibit 208 and 209. Yep. Uh, exhibit 208 and 209 will be admitted. Go ahead. And, Your Honor, permission to publish momentarily? You may, this is audio only, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, you may. Go ahead. Now, uh, Ms. Beckel, as a seasoned call taker uh, with over two years of experience with the Sheriff's Office, um, you had an opportunity to both listen to these calls and in the hallway. Um, and I'll ask you some questions about that um, after we listen to these uh, exhibits, okay? At this time, we'll publish People's Exhibit 208. People's Exhibit 208, uh, two minutes and 20 seconds in length. All right. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll publish uh, People's Exhibit 209. Both the spring house, and they said he wasn't there, and it's kind of like feeding and so forth. Like, yep. And then drive. And there are six two seven Mandan. Mandan M A N D A N. What is your son's name? I'm sorry, what? What is your son's name? Gannon, G A N N O. Tell me. Jacob. Yeah. And what else you last name? Uh, maybe around like, uh, what time do you guys go to school? Is it 3 30 maybe? Between 3 34 and you need to suppose to be back home at 6. That we live up all the time, like go to the neighbor's house, friend's house, they ride bikes, do everything together. <laughs> no. Or G, no, G man, but I mean, that's kind of like something we can't call in, but not friends. And if you want to ask this Why? 
not not that I'm aware of. Okay. And who else wants to see him? Uh, I guess me. She was in the house and I was working out and we were seeing every day. They have to play outside so many hours when it's night before they get technology and that was what he was supposed to be doing. Okay. When you asked him, was he on foot or did he have a bike or a skateboard with him? Uh, well, his bike is here. Okay. Look at how the skates work. Yeah, not here. And was he with anyone when he left? I don't I don't know that. I was in the house. And my husband let them, you know, walk around the neighborhood with the rest of the kids and things like that. So I don't even know we need a parent. I had to call him to get them their address. Is there anything on the carry any weapons? No, not that I'm aware of. No, I don't think okay. so. Is there a set of violence and mental illness? No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. For the purposes of the record, that was People's Exhibit 209, that was eight minutes and seven seconds long. All right. Uh, Ms. Beckel, in terms of your work with uh, the sheriff's department being a dispatcher receiving calls for service. Have you received calls for service similar in subject matter to this? Yes. Okay. And over the course, um, how many similar type of subject matter related calls would you estimate that you'd received? Uh, that's hard to put a number on probably upward of 50. Okay. In terms of being on those calls uh, with a reporting party, a parent, for example, how would you describe the demeanor of uh, the person identifying themselves as Leticia Stalk on those phone calls? Normally, if we had a child of that age that hasn't run away before, um, I would expect a little more, um, be scared a little more. Um, a little more anxiety over the issue, um, but it seems in par for all other runaway calls that we normally take for older aged children. So comparing, uh, again, the calls that you've been on when you receive reports uh, of a missing child, um, was this similar or dissimilar? It was similar. It was similar? Mm -hmm. The tone of the caller's voice was similar? Objection has to answer. Overruled. We'll go ahead and answer. I would say it was similar given the majority of runaway calls that we take. We don't get many for 11 year old um, children. I would say for children that we get runaway calls for that young, um, that it wasn't as similar. It was not as similar. Yes. And to be clear, um, the date and time that the call was first placed to the emergent line or the sheriff's office, do you recall what that time was? I do not. In receiving those calls, um, are, re are reports generated, uh, incident reports that record basic information as you input it into the system? Yes, it is. And that's based on input that both you're putting in? Correct. And um, also maybe automatic timestamps that a system may generate? Correct, there should have been an automatic one. Um, when the 911 call was placed, um, as well as I believe when anyone was dispatched out. And uh, as you're receiving these calls, this is information that you are reviewing um, real time as you're receiving these calls. Yes. And would reviewing that uh, incident report refresh recollection as to the specific time, the first time a phone call came into the emergent line? Yes, it would. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness? You may. For the record, I'm showing the witness uh, what's bait stamped as 3810 through 3812. Uh, Ms. Beckel, if you could take a moment uh, to review the specific time the first call came in. Uh, don't read directly from it, but just take a moment to review that.
that refresh your recollection as to the time that first call came in? Yes, it does. Uh, what time and date did the first call to the emergent line come in? Uh, it was January 27th at 1855, so 655 p.m. And based on the call then being routed to the non-emergent line, um, are you able to tell what time approximately the call was placed to the non-emergent line? Yes, can I refer back? Yes, if that would refresh your recollection. Yes. Yes, so that call um, came in at approximately 19.02, so 7.02 p.m. Your Honor, we'll pass the witness. Cross examination. How are you? Good, Ariel. I'm very good. So, from what I'm kind of gathering from you, you not uncommon to get calls regarding kids who aren't home when they're supposed to be home. Correct. And you kind of run the gamut of you know, emotions. If it's a 15 year old that's not home when they're not supposed to be home, not that emotional or less emotion. And if it's a five year old who may be 10 minutes late from being home, you may get a lot of emotion. Correct. And this was an 11 year old. And so the emotion was somewhere in between the 15 and the five year old. Yes. No further questions. Redirect. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Ms. Bethel? All right. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. Yeah. Here we would call Sergeant Rosario Hubble. You may approach and collect the exhibits. Uh, you may, yes. <clears throat> Sergeant Hubble, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. Yes, sir. You swear from the testimony about the goodness man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step. You step into the stand. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name, introduce yourself to the jury, and spell your last for the record? It's Rosario S. Hubble, last name Hubble, H-U-B-B-E-L-L. -L. Why don't we spell Rosario, too? Rosario is R-O-S-A-R-I-O. -O. Your nickname's Rocky? I go by Rocky, a little easier than Rosario. Sometimes it's a tongue twister. I'm not going to have you spell that, all right? What is your occupation? I'll apologize first, I'm recovering uh, from a chest cold, as you can hear, so I hope my voice uh, lasts. Uh, I may have Half to clear. the room is recovering from that same chest cold. Okay, <laughs> so you all understand if I have to clear my throat, I apologize. Um, I work for the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. I'm currently employed as the uh, sergeant for the patrol midnight shift. And there's some water to your right if you need some. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, how long you been with the Sheriff's Office? 16 years back in uh, January of 2020 what was your role in the sheriff's office I was assigned as the uh, major crimes uh, sergeant for the investigations division and how many sergeants were with the major crimes unit back then oh uh, one sergeant uh, so there were four sergeants in the investigations uh, division uh, I was assigned the major crimes unit okay so the major crimes unit what kind of cases do you investigate what kind of cases do you get involved in Okay, uh, major crimes, so um, assaults, major assaults, armed robberies, homicides, um, major child abuse cases where there's felony uh, level charges, which would mean that there are severe injuries to a child. Uh, my team also takes on uh, cold casework and uh, missing and runaway persons. That last category you just mentioned, is that how you became involved in this investigation? That is how I became involved, yes. So back in January of 2020, uh, specifically January 27th of 2020, 
Were you familiar that an individual by the name of Gannon Stalk went missing and was not able to be found? Um, <clears throat> so I believe the missing person's report came in on the night of the 27th. Okay. I was unaware of that. When did you become aware? I became aware the morning of the 20, January 28th. Tell the jury how you became aware of that. Um, I was at the office working, um, and I had received a request from the Fountain Police Department saying that they would offer assistance if we needed any assistance with the uh, missing 11-year-old, uh, which was the first I became aware um, of the report that patrol had taken. Uh, it was at that time that I got my team spun up uh, and uh, got them uh, en route to the 6627 uh, Mandan address uh, and started trying to get information on what patrol had learned at that point uh, and where we were. Um, I would, cause I was just getting started when Fountain had reached out to us. I had no idea that we were looking for anybody at this point. Okay. And so did you stay with the investigation as it progressed through time? I was the supervisor over that for the entire period. Yes. And so could you describe to the jury how the investigation progressed through time? We talked about it starting as a runaway or missing persons. Where did it eventually go? So yes, it, we started out as a missing person runaway case. Um, we then uh, got detectives involved. Um, detectives um, started to run a standard procedure for a missing persons case. We went out, we started to do things like ask for um, anything that might have uh, a sample of Gannon's DNA on it. Uh, we wanted to get a um, comparative sample. Um, and we started worst case scenario, scenario, scenarioing at that time, if I could say that word, um, which is part of our protocol to start building that up. Um, as we started to uh, go into um, our investigation, we started to get a lack of cooperation from um, Ms. Stout, who was our reporting party. Um, at that point, we knew that we needed to um, put more resources into locating um, again, and we were very concerned at this point. We didn't know the who, what, why, and where, but we definitely knew um, that with an 11 year old missing for the time period that we had now, um, things were not uh, going to end well if we couldn't find him immediately. Um, so we started ramping up from that missing person to potentially an abducted child. I reached out to CBI, tried to figure out what they wanted for an Amber Alert. We didn't have any information on, on um, that would match an abducted child because we didn't have a suspect, I didn't have a vehicle. Um, and at that point, that's when we started to expand. We started getting um, our search and rescue teams involved. There were obviously very many community groups that put together teams of people that were out searching. Um, we immediately turned our missing persons uh, runaway team into the entire investigations division. So not only was my major crimes unit, which is four detectives, <laughs> that's all we have, um, it was the rest of the unit. So all of the detectives that were available were now working full time on um, this case. And as the investigation progressed, were you relying on what the defendant, Ms. Stout, was telling you, being that she was the last person to see Gannon? That was our, our main focus was what information could Ms. Stout provide to help us locate Gannon, yes. And did, did that lead to several searches and search warrants of 6627 Mandan Drive, the residence where Gannon lived? Yes. And did the first search happen on really January 27th when first patrol officers went there and did a cursory search looking for Gannon in the house? That was the first one, correct, yes. And did it progress all the way through February? Yes, it did. Uh, and each time you went out there, did you learn more about what may have happened to Gannon at that residence? Yes, each each search provided more information and, and uh, helped develop the investigation uh, and helped push it further every time. And were you out there for the major majority of these searches? Um, I was out there, for, I would say for a few of them, I, don't, I, I would say that would constitute majority. Okay. I want to turn your attention to February 3rd of 2020. Do you recall going out to uh, that residence to do a search on that date? I do recall doing uh, some work out at the address on February 3rd, yes. Okay, 6627 Mandon Drive? At that, yes, that address. 
I don't want to get into all the details of the search, but I want to I want to turn your attention to Gannon's room. Did you have an understanding where Gannon's room was prior to February 3rd, 2020? Yes. Tell the jury about what you saw and noticed in Gannon's room on February 3rd, 2020, that may have escalated the investigation to uh, a homicide. So we had uh, denoted that there was um, blood evidence in the room on the walls, uh, on an electrical socket. The blood evidence that was located was um, very hard to see. Um, it wasn't easily visible to the human eye. Um, this is when we um, came to come back to the address and we wanted to use Blue Star uh, chemical that would give us a presumptive test if we, if we were able to locate blood um, that's not uh, visible to the human eye. Uh, it lights up under blue light, it gives us a luminescence, uh, and it tells us we want to concentrate on that spot. That was a uh, presumptive hit for blood. We went to Gannon's room. I specifically went down there. Um, due to the blood evidence that I could visibly see, it appeared to me that the blood had been uh, cleaned up. I was um, interested in an electrical socket that was down near the, the borderline of the wall. Um, there was carpet underneath, and if there had been a large presence of blood, sometimes cleaning that blood, you can push the blood through to the backside of the, the carpet or into the pad. So the uh, carpet was pulled back. I put, had a patch that I believed was, was uh, possible blood, so it was very stiff, um, appeared to be cleaned. And I had reached out and touched that portion uh, and realized that when I reached out and touched it, I wasn't wearing gloves at the time. So I made a note in my report that I had touched that area, didn't glove up. Um, if we were able to pull any DNA, I'd have to provide a sample. Sure, go ahead. Uh, but I was able to pull the carpet back at that point and notice that there was saturation through the carpet uh, into the carpet pad and that there was staining on the cement uh, that appeared all to be from uh, blood stain. And did that escalate the investigation at that point? Uh, yes, absolutely. And was the, was the location of this uh, area that you just described that you touched that soaked through the padding into the concrete, was that directly below Gannon's bed? It would have been in a location where Gannon's bed would have been, yes. Now, as a result of this, did that lead you to look for a blood stain pattern expert to come in and perhaps do an analysis on Gannon's wall and, and the bedroom. Yes, that did. It led us to uh, reach out. And who did you reach out to? We reached out to uh, Tom Griffin of Bevel and Gardner. Uh, I took a crime scene reconstruction class, became certified in level one crime scene reconstruction. And my instructor was uh, Mr. Tom Griffin of Bevel and Gardner. And I had uh, went through my chain of command and uh, suggested that uh, Tom Griffin uh, be contacted to see if he would be able to assist in uh, analyzing the uh, scene for us. Okay. And earlier you mentioned Blue Star. Um, do you recall talking about the Blue Star? I remember previously, yes. And was there a large amount of Blue Star used within the entire residence at 6627 Mandan Drive? Yes, there was a lot of Blue Star used. And were you out there for the majority of these searches where Blue Star was being used? For the most part, yes. And on February 25th of 2020, did you go out with a video recorder and document 6627 Mandon Drive, the entire residence, uh, to kind of summarize where the Blue Star was placed, where evidentiary items were, where rooms were, and things like that? Yes, I did uh, head out to 6627 Mandan, and I took a uh, video recorder with me, and due to the complexity of the scene, um, it's hard to sit down in a report and put down cardinal directions to tell you that this house generally faces north. We're talking about a bedroom that was in the south uh, east corner of the residence. So I used the video recorder to go to that residence, 6627 Mandan Drive, and record the entire uh, residents uh, so that there would be a, uh, an optical capture of the uh, of the scene. 
And would that video assist the jury in understanding the layout of the house, where the blue star was applied, uh, and things of that nature? I think it would help clarify quite a bit, yes. Your Honor, may I approach your witness? You may. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as 317. Do you recognize that disc? I do recognize it. And what is that disc? This is the disc that has the um, video of that I captured of the residents. And does that actually depict the entirety of the video that you took on March 25th, 2020 of 6627 Mandon Drive? Yes, this includes uh, the entirety of that video. Move to admit 372. Defense. Is there an objection? Exhibit 372 will be admitted. And I think it's approximately 22 minutes long. I don't know if you want to play it or do you want to take a break first? However, the court let's, wants. Let's take a break first and then we can play it all in its entirety. Otherwise. Yeah, let's take a break first. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our afternoon break. Uh, so if I can have everyone back in the Drew room at say 325, we should be able to start on time at that point. Again, don't discuss case among yourselves. Don't discuss case with anyone else. Don't do your own independent investigation about any aspect of the case. And we'll see you back at 325. All right, to the jury, please. <laughs> we can get it later. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. May all be seated, Sergeant. You can go ahead and step down if you'd like to do that. Over into the restroom. And you can have the sergeant sit in the back while the video plays. If you want to do that. Okay. It's fine. fine. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if maybe we can approach just before we all take our break. Right here. Okay. okay. Come forward.
This is the gate that leads to the backyard of 6627 Mandan. As you can see, the gate is locked from the exterior side of the fence. This is the front entry into 6627 Mandan Drive. This would be from the front door. This is the upper level of the home. There are two bedrooms, the kitchen and living room area, and a sliding glass door to the backyard, and then the laundry room area, which exits into the garage for this residence. To the right is the first bedroom. This would be the room where Lena stays. So you enter the front hallway, you see that it opens up into the kitchen area of the residence. The kitchen does have a sliding glass door that exits to the backyard of the residence. We will exit that in a moment and show the other side of the gate from the backyard perspective. So the living room area. Our main hallway. This enters into the master bedroom. Which has an attached bathroom and walk-in closet area. Moving back out towards the garage. The area in front of you is the laundry area. We'll move into the garage.
since we are in the garage, I will start with some points of interest. The four planks that you see on the ground are in the position they were during the first call when Gannon was reported to be missing. You can see that the tops of the boards have been sawed off. These were collected after a blood reagent called Blue Star was used on the ends of the four boards that had been cut, and there was a positive reaction. That positive reaction gives us a presumptive that blood was present on those boards. On the garage floor, in the area that we're looking at between the broom, the cord, and the empty space on the floor, there were some blue star uh, reactions on the floor in this area. They were in the form of droplets. They were not very large. As we move from the concrete to the stairs, there was a blue star reaction on the stair showing a potential possible partial shoe impression that again with it being blue star that reaction tells us it's presumptive for blood moving up into the laundry area the tile in the laundry room did have positive reaction to the blue star again telling us the potential presence uh, for blood they were small um, hits it, in the laundry area, basically they were uh, droplet size, not much larger than that. If we close the laundry room door to the garage, you can see that there is still blood on the door and on the door handle. This would be the door leading into the garage. We'll turn around in the laundry room. The last blue star hit of note was down at the baseline where the tile meets the carpet. It would be in your right hand side of the frame where the doorway begins and that frame for the doorway, there was a hit with the blue star agent right where the carpet meets the tile and meets the hole for the doorway. That hit then led to us moving into the living room area. Again, this was the upstairs living and kitchen room area. You'll see the carpet area here. The carpet area in focus had a reaction to the blue star. The carpet appears ripped in this area. That rip is for checking the underside of that carpet to look for saturation, and there was none found. The stairs were then tested with the Blue Star reagent. There were positive hits on the stairs. They were small drop patterns, um, not much larger than uh, a quarter for most of the stains. Um, there was more of a reaction from the Blue Star showing that there was heavy cleaning going on. The cleaning um, reacts with the Blue Star, but it does not provide a, an immediate reaction. It pro provides a slow illuminating reaction after some time, which indicated to us that there was some cleaning um, of the stairs and this landing area prior to heading down the stairs. There's a luminol reaction on this landing. You can see that the carpet is not in its proper position. That carpet has also been pulled up underneath the carpet. 
to check for saturation stains to the other side, and none were located. The baseboards around this landing did illuminate uh, when the blue star was applied, um, showing that presumptive reaction for blood. Continuing down the stairs into the basement, luminol or correction blue star was used um, on the stairs going down. The blue star uh, reacted to the stairs. Again, these were small hits, quarter size, and some significant cleaning. This patch of carpet into the basement illuminated with blue star showing that there was a lot of cleaning going on in this area. There was a very small single reaction to uh, blue star at the base of the table. That again was about quarter size. As we hit the bottom of the stairs, this is the basement area of the residence. If you continue around to the right, you will see that there is a closet. It's a storage closet. We have a bedroom down here all the way to the right. This would have been Harley's bedroom. We have another bathroom area. This bedroom has a closet attached to it. In the storage closet. In the living room, we have the couch. The area removed from the couch was the area that candle wax was located. This was in the area for the Sunday night candle event where the candle was ordered to be knocked over. When it was knocked over, it ignited a fire in the carpet. A portion of the carpet that was originally cut out was in this area here. You can still see some of the padding or the burn mark for where the padding melted. This would be the area that the candle landed. While doing a search, the area next to the candle, blue star was used. There was a positive hit, again, being presumptive uh, for blood. So a larger portion of the carpet was then cut out uh, and retained so that that could be tested. Moving back in the basement, heading back to the stairs where you came down. Again, Blue Star reacted in this area, showing a large cleaning event. We had a single hit or by this furniture leg about the size of a quarter. We come around to the hallway. We have a storage room. And then if you continue to the right, you have Gannon's bedroom. Before going into Gannon's bedroom, 
There was blue star used in the hallway. It reacted showing a small trail, which led to the storage area. On the floor in the storage area, you can see that there are several locations that have been marked with Sharpie. Those are areas that were illuminated with Blue Star and showed a presumptive for uh, blood, that blood was present. There is a trail that leads back into the storage room towards the sump pump located in the corner. The trail ending at that box. All these boxes were removed. Blue Star was used on the entire room. It was just this particular trail that has been marked and highlighted that was located. There were no other presump uh, presumptive positives uh, for blood in the storage room. Backing out of the storage room, moving into Gannon's room. The room is normally set up so that the blue and red table is generally sitting underneath the window. This bed would be set up, ready to go. The second bed in the room would occupy this voided location, the southwest corner of the room. If you continue around in the room, there is a closet in the northeast corner of the room. Of Norton Gannon's room is the large stain in the south east corner of the room. The markings that you see on the wall are marking spatter marks that were denoted by the Metro Crime Lab. Each of these stickers is indicating a blood spatter pattern. that was uh, denoted and documented. The carpet had a large stain that saturated through the carpet, through the padding, leaving this stain on the concrete. For marking purposes, a red Sharpie was used to outline the outskirts of the pattern showing you how large the pattern actually is. Over here you can see where the carpet and the padding, what they would look like if they were present. I will then reverse my steps, go back up to the living area. I will go out the sliding glass door and show you the reverse side of the side gate, showing you that it does not lock from the interior, that it locks from the exterior side. And that will conclude the video tour at that point.
This will be the year of our rear yard of 6627. This portion of the fence has recently been removed. It was not the original position of that fence during our initial walkthrough of the scene. This is the exterior of the side gate leading to the front of the residence. As you can see, the rear side of this fence or interior side of this fence is not secured. It is secured by the padlock on the front side of the gate. This will conclude the video tour of 6627 Mandan Drive by Sergeant Hubble. Current time is approximately 2.23 p.m. Sergeant Hubble, if you would resume your seat and witness stand, I remind you, sir, that you're still under oath. <laughs> Mr. Young. Thank you, Judge. Sergeant Hubble, um, by the time you shot this video on February 25th, 2020, had Al Stalk moved out of the residence and had the sheriff's department basically held that residence? Uh, that is correct, yes. Do you know approximately when Mr. Stalk moved out of the residence? I don't recall. That's fine. Those are my questions, John. Thanks. Cross-examination. Thank you. Hi, Sergeant. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? I'm good. So what date was this video taken? I believe that was the, uh, I have to really look at my notes again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Blanking here from my cold. Oh, okay. What? Uh, it was uh, Feb late in February. Okay. What was the date of the actual Blue Star application? At the the drive searches were several days prior to that. Okay. And were you able to get any photographic evidence or video of the actual blue star illuminating or fluorescing under the dark lights? I know one of the techs was having a hard time capturing their um, blue star hits. There were several different um, applications applied. So there were some that were captured and some that weren't. Um, you'd have to speak with the crime scene text to get a, a total on that. Okay, but it, it looks like in your report, uh, you were there at the house when the blue star was applied and that testing was being done, correct? I was there, yes. Okay. How many crime scene texts were there when the blue star was applied and um, you know, everybody was marking on the ground with Sharpies, like, here's a hit, here's a hit, here's a hit. Do you remember how many people were there? Um, for the instance where um, the Blue Star illuminated uh, in the storage area, which is the one where the Sharpies were used, mm -hmm. um, we had two crime scene techs there. I had, uh, we had to pull all those boxes out. So I believe there was myself, and I think two to three other detectives, I don't recall specifically, um, that were present as well. Okay. And I just want to clarify, in the storage room, uh, you had some hits uh, that was marked or memorialized by uh, Sharpie marks on the concrete, correct? Yes. Okay. And it looks like there's a wall of boxes. And then there's looks like there's some small uh, hits that go right up to this wall of boxes, correct? Yes. Um, since you brought it up, and I just want to clarify, beyond the wall of boxes, there was a sump pump in the corner, correct? Yes. Okay. Was there 
any markings or any hits near this sump pump? Um, there might have been a, some smaller hits closer, but it ended at the sump pump. Okay. And were these hits, uh, so beyond this wall of boxes, there were additional hits, is your testimony? There may have been one or two hits, yes. Okay. The trail ends at basically at the sump pump, so the boxes may have, may have covered up one or two or three of the hits in that area. Okay. There wouldn't be any more than that. But you took all the boxes out to make sure any positive hits for blood through the Blue Star were not covered. Yeah, the room was empty when they Blue Starred, yes. Okay. And there would have been a photograph of every hit or some kind of documentation of every hit? Yes. Okay. So what is the Blue Star actually testing for? Uh, the Blue Star is giving us a presumptive for, uh, uh, to get sp really specific, you'd need to talk to the crime lab about that. Okay. But it gives us the, the building blocks of blood, which is protein and iron. Okay. So it's not actually presumptive for blood, it's presumptive for the presence of iron. Well, for the chemicals that make up blood or the elements that make up blood. One That's why the, it's a presumptive. The, the it main tells us to test more. The main one of the main elements of blood is iron, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you know if at any point there had been um, any swabs taken of some of the blood uh, to test for DNA or blood match identification, anything like that? <clears throat> On the presumptive hits? Yes, or before the blue yeah, the star was done, was there like DNA swabs taken, swabs taken of any of these marks, any of these uh, probable or likely uh, blood spatter to Yes, to there, were, test there were swabs taken, yes. Okay. Were you there at the house when the uh, swabs were collected or taken? Uh, yes. Okay. And presumably there was further testing done on those? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you actually collect the swabs or would that have been CSI technicians? No, the CSI technicians would do that. Okay. Just a moment, Your Honor. Mr. Sergeant, redirect. No, thank you. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Sergeant Cobble? Just write it down. That's important. Council would retrieve that and approach the bench, please.
Uh, Sergeant Hubble, sorry. Sergeant Hubble, a blue star reacts with blood to make it visible. Does blue star in any way compromise the subsequent analysis of the collected blood sample? That would be a great question for the crime lab. Uh, I don't know how they rule out what portion was blue star. Um, there, when we'd go from presumptive to actually a final analysis, a scientist would be able to explain it to you better. They have a very pinpoint specific chemical makeup that they're looking for. When they say something's positive for blood, they mean it's 100% positive after lab testing. Um, so I, I don't know what their process is. So I couldn't answer if they test out the blue star or if the blue star doesn't affect it at all. I don't know the answer. Okay. And uh, that, um, that answer is helpful for the next uh, question, uh, which I'm not going to ask uh, a lot of because I think it's more properly directed to other witnesses, but I will ask this question. Um, was the trash bin outside searched for evidence? The night that the original search was done by uh, my team, Sergeant Kurt Smith was there and present. And I believe um, he informed me that that trash can was uh, looked at, yes, okay. from my memory. All right, I will allow reasonable follow-up as to those questions only, prosecution. Oh, thank you. Mr. Cook? All right, thank you, Sergeant, you may step down. Thank you. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. <clears throat> Amanda Van Nest. Sorry, last name? Van Nest, V-A-N-S-E-S. Van -S -S -E -S thank you. Ms. Van Nest, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, ma'am. Up there. Yep. Everybody does. Everybody does that. It's okay. All right. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Everybody's been doing that too. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> will you please introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your name for the record? Yes. My name is Amanda Van Nest. A-M-A-N-D-A, -A -A. my last name is two words, V as in Victor, A, N as in Nancy, space, N as in Nancy, E-S-T. Ms. Van Nest, um, what work do you do? I am a forensic nurse examiner at UC Health Memorial Hospital. What is a forensic nurse examiner? So a forensic nurse ex examiner is a registered nurse um, that sees patients who are exposed to violence. How long have you been doing that work? I have been there and doing that for about six and a half years. Do you have some education that allows you to do that job? I do. Please tell the jury about that. So in a, I have my bachelor's of science in nursing and my registered nurse license through the state of Colorado. Um, in addition to that, there was education that was um, that I took. It was a 64 hour course um, specifics, specific to forensic nursing. And then in addition to that, I did a full-time orientation um, for 12 weeks. Do you have professional affiliations as well? I do. I am affiliated with the International Association of Forensic Nurses. Do you have um, particular certifications as well? I do. I have my um, SANE adult adolescent and SANE pediatric certifications through the IAFN. Do you also attend regular training? I do. Tell the jury about that, please. Um, so in order to maintain my specialized certifications, so my SANE A and SANE P, um, I have to, um, boy, losing my words, um, I have to um, complete continuing education credits um, for that. And I believe off the top of my head, I, I'm trying to think, but I believe it's somewhere in the realm of 30 continuing education credits um, every two years for both of those certifications. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> have you ever testified as an expert in, as a forensic nurse examiner? I have. How many times? Um, roughly six. What jurisdictions? Um, El Paso County. Okay. <clears throat> Can you give the, the jury a 
I guess, a scope of what it means to be a forensic nurse examiner, just what you do in your day-to-day -day work? Yes, so as a forensic nurse examiner at UC Health Memorial Hospital, um, because everywhere's a little bit different, but um, in terms of what I do, like I said, I see anybody who's been exposed to violence. So things that kind of follow under that umbrella are domestic violence, sexual assault, um, child abuse, um, human trafficking, physical assaults, strangulations. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we also um, are able to perform suspect evidence collections for law enforcement. How do you determine that somebody's been exposed to violence? Um, we are notified um, either by the primary nurse that's caring for them, or if the patient has reported a sexual assault, um, it, we're notified by um, like the intake um, at the emergency room when they come in, um, the techs at intake or the providers in intake um, of them at that time. Okay. <clears throat> and I sort of jumped ahead a little bit here, but Your Honor, at this time I have moved for a qualification of Ms. Van Est as an expert witness as a forensic nurse examiner. Uh, the witness will be so qualified. Go ahead. Thank you. So um, when we're talking about um, the way that you determine whether somebody's been exposed to violence, is that something that you typically will rely on? So other people will collect information, you'll review that information and then determine a course of action on to how you're going to interact with that person as well? Um, a lot of times, typically, we get very minimal information um, from the, the primary nurse, from the provider, um, just that, hey, they're here and they're reporting you know, the specific situation, we would like you to see them. Or, hey, we're concerned that this could be going on, um, we would like you to see them. And is it typical for you to rely on that sort of input from other nurses to give you that information? Yes. The, the types of information that you might get to determine that somebody's been exposed to violence, can that be a self-reported um, exposure to violence, meaning that a person is saying they have been a victim? Yes. Can it be that police potentially are bringing somebody in and they are saying this person has been a victim of, of violence? Yes. Are all of those fairly typical interactions or ways that you become involved in a case? They are. I want to jump into a particular investigation that we've been sitting here listening to witnesses uh, from for uh, a little over a week now, and that's the investigation into Gannon Stauk, uh, who went missing on January 27, 2020. Did you get involved in that investigation? I did. When did you get involved? I became involved on January 29th, 2020. What were the circumstances of you becoming involved in this case? Um, I was notified by the primary nurse um, that Leticia had come in to the hospital um, reporting chest pain, and she was also reporting a sexual assault. Do you know how she got to the hospital? I cannot recall. Do your, um, the records that you would have, uh, would it be something that would record that information? It would. Do you remember uh, being told that it was by ambulance, that she was brought to the hospital yes. by ambulance? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and you mentioned that um, you were told that Leticia, as you knew at the time, uh, was suffering from chest pain and dizziness, I think you just said? Yes, that's correct. What about her condition? Was it stable, unstable? It was stable at the time. What does that mean when somebody's condition is stable? Um, that there weren't any, there wasn't anything that was life threatening at that time. Okay. And so, that, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, that was deemed by the emergency room provider. Okay. Do you also rely on information that is reported to you by EMS staff that is, like in this case, traveling with a patient by ambulance to the hospital? Yes, I do. What information did you get as it relates to that portion of the uh, information? Um, at that time, um, I did not get report from the EMS staff. Um, I had just gotten report from the primary nurse in the emergency room as they were the ones that had spoken with EMS. As a forensic nurse examiner, have you had a chance to review um, any records that have uh, recollections of that information? Yes. And what was that information that EMS reported in those records? Um, to the best of my <laughs> recollection when going over that, um, that EMS had reported that she had reported chest pain along with sexual assault. What about um, her interactions with people in the, uh, in the ambulance as to 
would she talk sometimes and then not talk other times? Um, best of my recollection, so I'm having a hard time remembering. That's okay. Um, I know that um, she had not spoken a lot about the sexual assault. Okay. And uh, obviously this has been three years ago now, correct? That is correct. If I showed you a particular page, would it refresh your memory as to um, specifics as to what EMS reported in these records? It would. And I may approach uh, and refresh memory. You may, go ahead. And just so that defense is uh, tracking with me, I'm at pagination number 480068. I'm also, while I'm going up there just to save steps, going to uh, provide the witness with people's exhibits 340 through 353, which are photographs. Yeah. So if you could read this paragraph here and then tell me when you're done, I'll retrieve that. For you. Yes. Does that refresh your memory? Yes. Do you remember there being a distinction in what EMS was reporting as to when uh, Letitia would talk and when she would not talk? Yes. Um, it was reported by EMS um, that she would speak with them um, when law enforcement was not present. But then when law enforcement was present, um, she tended to be quiet and not talk, pretended to be asleep. Um, did she also make any statements as to any neurological um, issues that she may be facing at that time? Not to me. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking to the EMS that's recorded in those records. No. Okay. <clears throat> Um, is it typical for when somebody comes in under this uh, sort of a scenario that they would be provided a HIPAA form? Yes. What is HIPAA, first of all? Um, so HIPAA is basically your, the patient's right to privacy to protect their medical records. Um, when they come in contact with me, um, that is one of the forms um, that I review with them. So did you review this specific form with this person? I did. And does this basically... Uh, do they are they asked to sign the form at some point? They are. Does that acknowledge that they understand what their rights are as far as privacy and that they understand all of that sort of thing? Yes. When you went over this particular form with uh, with Leticia on uh, January 29th, did she make that indication that she understood her HIPAA rights and signed that form with no problems? Yes. Are those fairly uh, important rights that people uh, should be made aware of when they're um, going in for hospital care? Absolutely. Can that sometimes be confusing for people? It can. Was there any confusion on this on the part of this person? Um, you can rephrase the question as to how she appeared. Sure. Did she appear to have any confusion or problems with this particular form or understanding the gravity of signing a HIPAA form? She did not appear to. Do you remember how she signed that particular form? What name? Um, it's okay. On my on my medical release form, I believe she signed it Tisha. Okay, perfect. Is there also a place on that form for the date? Yes, there is. Did she put the correct date on that form? Um, so that would have been myself filling that out. Okay. And then right. reviewing it with her. So Okay. The uh the person that you were having contact with that had gone over this form with you and then signed it, is that person here in the courtroom? Yes. Will you please identify her by where she is sitting and what she's wearing, please? Yes, she is sitting over there and she's wearing a green long sleeve shirt. You're gesturing over to your right to defense counsel table? Yes, I am. And is it either of these two males or is it a female? The female. Okay, thank you. You want to ask that the record reflect that she's identified the defendant? The record will so reflect. Go ahead. Thank you. Just want to make sure Mr. Cook was paying attention over here. <laughs> when you're having interactions with... Um, with the with uh, Leticia at that time, was a detective around all the time? No. Was there often a lot of time when you were just one on one with her? Majority of the time, I was one on one with her. 
when you have contact with a person under these sorts of scenarios, um, do you tell them what an FNE is, a forensic nurse examiner? I do. Does that, is it oftentimes foreign for people uh, to understand what you, your job is and how you're going to potentially help them? Yes. <laughs> do you have to go through a lengthy explanation of what your role is? I do. What does that sound like when you go? Yeah, so um, my spiel with a patient is um, I'm a forensic nurse examiner. Um, I am a nurse that is specialized in caring for patients who have been exposed to violence. Um, and kind of like I explained it before, um, so these include patients who have been exposed to domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, I believe I left out elder abuse earlier, um, strangulation, human trafficking, kind of all of those types of things. Um, I understand that you're here today um, because of why ever they're, you know, whatever they're there for. Um, so in this case, um, I understand that you were here because you were sexually assaulted, is that right? Um, so she confirmed that for me. And so then I go into a little bit further. Here are the different things that I can offer for you. Um, everything that I do is entirely up to my patient. They don't have to do anything, but it is something that we do offer. So you, you're leading right into my next question, and that is, <clears throat> can a, a person that's in the hospital under these conditions say, you know what, I appreciate you giving me that spiel. I don't want to talk to you. Absolutely. Does that happen sometimes? It does. What did this person do, uh, the Leticia, when you had contact with her? She wanted to continue talking with me. When, when you said that uh, you asked them to verify the nature of the claim, uh, did you do that with her? I did. What did she say happened? Um, initially, I you know just confirmed that she was sexually assaulted. Um, she had reported to me that um, she was, that her son was missing um, because he had been kidnapped by a construction worker that had come into the home and sexually assaulted her. So the same person, according to her, both sexually assaulted her and kidnapped her 11-year-old stepson? Correct. Do you have, do you make an offer to uh, people that are in the hospital under these conditions to perform some sort of a physical examination? I do. What's the purpose of this physical exam? Um, so the purpose of the physical exam, and I can kind of go into all of it, all of the different things that I talk about with them and um, her options. But the first part of that um, is to get a history from her as to what happened. So that better allows me um, to per, um, come up and establish my plan of care for medical diagnosis and treatment. The physical exam is next. So depending on what she told me happened, um, that helps me to figure out where I need to collect evidence. Um, it helps me figure out what areas I need to focus on, you know, in terms of where there could be potential injury, um, those types of things. And then the third part of that um, is also medications. So we offer different medications as well um, to prevent sexually transmitted infections, pregnancy prevention, and HIV. Is this exam that you're describing, can it be fairly invasive and potentially shocking to somebody that's already gone through some traumatic event? I would say it can be. Did uh, Leticia, when you had contact with her then on that day, did she want to go forward with this process, at least express that early on? She did, yes. Is it typical for you to go over psychological and social history with a person? Yes. Did you do that with this person? I did. What information did you learn from her as far as psychological history? So in terms of her psych social history, um, we obtained just a lot of information about um, the patient themselves, um, who they live with, who's, um, you know, kids in the home, are there weapons in the home, drug and alcohol use, um, is there any domestic violence? Um, all of these different things help to assess for, you know, for risk factors so that we can figure out you know, are there additional safety concerns um, or additional resources that we can offer? And are you just asking them for uh, their own self-report of their psychosocial history? Yes. Do you ever have opportunity to look at other sources for that? Like say, if somebody's seen a psychologist in the past, would you have access to that necessarily? Not necessarily, no. So most of the time, is it just self-report? Yes. <clears throat> Did... Um, Leticia, when you had contact with her, report any sort of um, psychological history? Um, she reported a history of generalized anxiety disorder. 
what does generalized anxiety disorder mean? So I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, so you know, my understanding as a nurse, um, generally, um, so it's anxiety. So it's kind of that worry that would cross into um, your everyday life. So it's excessive worry, um, unrealistic worry um, that kind of takes over your everyday. Does that rise to the level of a severe mental disease or defect? Objection foundation outside of it. This is saying you'd have to lay for the foundation for their expertise. Um, well, Judge, I think that a layperson under statute under these conditions can give their opinion as to that information, which we will get to. I understand what you're saying, though. Well, she can, she can testify about um, how she appeared and whether she thought that there was a mental disease or something like that. The problem that you had was that you asked for the severe mental disease, and she said that uh, she's not a psychologist. So I, I think there's some things that you can get, just not that particular question. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I was just saying okay. that the statute does allow that sort of uh, lay opinion testimony. Uh, <clears throat> did she also give you a description of any medication that she was prescribed as it relates to this generalized anxiety? Yes, um, she reported that she took lorazepam or Ativan as needed. In your experience, um, have you had uh, contact with people that have uh, that sort of generalized anxiety that are prescribed with lorazepam? I believe I have. Okay. I guess during the, the this portion of your contact with Letitia at the hospital. Uh, were you also in contact with detectives uh, from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office? I was. Uh, and did you also know that uh, the that Letitia was coming directly from the sheriff's office in that ambulance to the hospital for the same exam? Um, after she arrived, yes. Okay. Uh, and this goes towards uh, your interactions and why you're having these types of interactions with her going forward. Were you being told by somebody from El Paso County Sheriff's Office? that there was a warrant coming to collect particular types of evidence? I was. Search warrant, I mean, not an arrest warrant. Yes, correct. What do you do with that information in mind? Um, is there anything? Just knowing that that is going to be part of my plan of care for her. Okay. At some point, um, roughly about 6.45 p.m. on January 20, or, uh, Yep, January 29th. Uh, did you describe for Leticia two different types of exams? A suspect exam, I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. A suspect exam and a SANE exam. I did. What are the differences between a suspect exam and a SANE exam? Um, so the suspect exam is um, what he was talking about in regards to the search warrant. So with the search warrant, there are specific um, things that are ordered to be collected by a judge. Um, so when I was talking earlier about the SANE exam, everything being voluntary, um, the suspect evidence collection, none of that is voluntary. Um, all of those things um, are required and stated in the search warrant. Um, in regards to the SANE exam, that is still something that is, or sexual assault exam, um, that is still something that is entirely up to her in regards to what she wants to do with that piece. Did she appear to understand uh, from her interactions with you that she understood, understood, first of all, the difference between a suspect exam and a SANE exam? Yes. Uh, did she indicate to you whether she wanted to continue to move forward with this process? I have an objection to relevance when we're like, it would be well when she knows as to the search.
The objections overruled, Mr. Allen. <clears throat> Thank you. So after um, you give this exam, uh, this description of there's two different types of exams that are potential in this particular case. Uh, and I think I already asked you this, but just to make sure, did she indicate that she still wanted to proceed forward even though there were potentially two prongs going forward? Yes. Did she seem to understand um, to you that what those two different prongs were? Yes, she did. And verbalized to you that she still wanted to go forward? Yes. Is there a separate place in the hospital that you take somebody under these conditions to potentially collect this type of evidence from a person's body? Yes. Is that basically an evidence collection room? Um, that is our exam room. Okay. Did you go over the idea with this person, Leticia, about um, collecting specimens from her body? I did. Is that, does that include um, giving her an advisement of what that means? Yes, as I, as I do the evidence collection, I um, let her know, um, in this case, for example, the search warrant, what it says. So she specifically knows what I'm going to be collecting. Okay. And is that something that a person would sign off on? Um, that is something that they can sign off on. Did this person, Leticia, did she sign off on it? She did. At some point, did she indicate to you that um, her daughter may be in the waiting room? She did. What did she say about that? Um, she had told me that her daughter was in the waiting room and that um, she was a good source of support. Um, and so that she wanted her present for when we did the scene exam portion. Did, uh, did Leticia then leave the uh, exam room and go to wherever she's su suggesting her daughter is? She did. After the suspect evidence collection was completed off of the search warrant, um, she had gone to the waiting room, told me she was going to the waiting room to get her daughter. And was the plan, at least the way you understood it, was that she would return and complete the SANE exam? That is correct. Did she return? No, she did not. What types of evidence did you collect with her? So there's, we've now had the two different things sort of discussed. Uh, the evidence collection under the, um, from a suspect basically, uh, did you collect some things from her at that time? I did. Tell the jury what that was. So I collected buckle swabs, which are swabs of the inside of um, her cheek for her DNA. Um, I also collected fingernail scrapings. So scrapings from underneath her fingernails. And I also, um, in addition on the search warrant, um, collected blood um, for her DNA, as well as a direct visualization um, of her head and of her hands with photo documentation. We'll talk about that visual examination in just a moment. What do you do when you collect buckles? So I take two cotton tip swabs. Um, they look like Q-tips um, out of a pre-sealed package and I swab the inside of both cheeks of my patient. Um, after I do that, I put it in a drying rack that's labeled with buckle and time it. And why do you do it that way? Um, that's my process and that's the way that I always do it. So I make sure that I don't mess up or do anything that um, would hinder that. Is it basically to just ensure that it's a uh, viable uh, collection of DNA essentially? Yes. Uh, once it's dried, what do you do with it? Um, once it's dried, um, I will package it into an envelope and label it with um, what it is, um, with the patient's name, um, my initials, and the date and time that I collected it, and seal it with an evidence seal. Um, it's red evidence tape. And then I will um, initial that tape as well to verify that I am the one that's doing the packaging. Your Honor, may I approach with People's Exhibit 371? Good. Ms. Van Ness, do you recognize People's Exhibit 371? Um, I, I don't. Do you see the evidence sticker on there? I do. Should have some sort of a description. Your Honor, may I approach again? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You recognize that now? I do. Yes. Uh, if I didn't 
appear to be? It um, appears to be 411, which is search warrant um, collection of Letitia, um, 8-4-1983, collected by state nurse. Is that the buckle swabs that you collected from Letitia Stock, the defendant in this case, back on January 29th, 2020? Yes. And is it typical that if you notice as you're holding it that it's cooler than uh, everything else in the room probably? Yes. Is it typical because it's a DNA sample that it, those are kept cold? That is my understanding. <clears throat> Does that, um, would you need to open that to, to verify that that's the buckle swabs that you collected or do you um, trust it based on that lab? Um, um, I, I trust that that's right, but to say one with 100% certainty, I would have to open it. Okay. So there are some gloves there to your right and there should be some scissors as well. In your arm while she's um, opening that. Uh, my Once I move for admission, if this is admitted, because it does have to be kept cold, uh, we would ask permission to then take it back to the uh, freezer. Do you have a preference on where this needs to be cut? No, I don't have a preference. Whatever is most convenient for you. Okay. Uh, the only issue I see is chain of custody because she's going to have, it's going to have a hole in it. Yeah, so we can actually write a report about that with our investigator. That's who brought it up to me. So there, it looks like there's three different items inside of that bigger bag. Is that right? That is correct. And it looks like you're holding a whitish um, envelope sized item. I am. And what does that appear to be? Um, so this is the evidence collection kit that I collected. So in here, I would have put her buckle swabs as well as the fingernail scrapings. Does it appear to be uh, the actual buckle swabs that you collected back on January 29th, 2020? I would have to open it again to okay. tell you for sure. All right, go ahead and open it. Okay. Yes. More envelopes. More envelopes. Um, so these are the envelopes that I was talking about that I put the cotton swabs into. Um, so this one is labeled buckle swabs. And yes, this is what I collected. These are the buckle swabs that you collected from this defendant back on January 29th, 2020. Correct. <clears throat> Does it appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition today as when you collected them back in January 29th? Yes. Now at this time, I've moved for admission of People's Exhibit 371 and then uh, with the obviously the uh, condition that I expressed just a moment ago. Uh, Mr. Swain? No objection. Exhibit 371 will be admitted. Go ahead. May I retrieve that exhibit, Your Honor? Thanks and turn that back over to our investigator to put back in the table. And so that the record is clear, you have this designated as just buckle swab. It's also labeled, right? Uh, yes, that's a good point. Well, it should be um, inside of that. Are there also the finger um, clippings, scrapings? That is correct. From the same defendant that you collected the buckles on? That is correct. Yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. It's like a Russian nesting egg. You get just kept pulling out envelopes. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <clears throat> so we talked earlier about um, the 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 defendant left um, after saying that she wanted to go see her daughter in the waiting room. And, and did she ever come back? She did not. 
during your interaction with her, uh, do you ask her specific questions about uh, what might have happened, when it happened, uh, if there's any injuries that you need to look at, that kind of thing? I do. When did she indicate to you that this sexual assault uh, purportedly happened? Um, she reported that it happened on January 27th between 2.45 and 4 in the afternoon. Did she say where it happened? Um, at her home. Did she give you any indication as to a potential suspect as to that uh, committed this uh, sexual assault? She did. Um, she reported it was a construction worker named Eduardo. It was a construction worker from the neighborhood that she lived in? Yes. Did she um, also describe some interaction of uh, her stepson as she's being sexually assaulted to you? She did. As it relates to this person who is assaulting her? Yes. What did she say about that? Um, she reported that her stepson, um, while she was being sexually assaulted by Eduardo, um, had jumped on his back to try to get him off of her. Do you ask um, questions, and I guess this might be pertaining to whether you're going to successfully find potentially DNA samples from a suspect and that kind of thing. Uh, do you ask questions about uh, any bodily fluid transfers, that kind of thing? I do. Did you ask this particular defendant those questions as well? I did. Such as, did the person that sexually assaulted ejaculate? Yes. Did she have any information for you on that? She did not. Did she specifically say, I don't think so, when asked if the assailant had ejaculated? Yes, she did. Do you also ask whether they've cleaned themselves? So if a sexual assault victim has come in, uh, is it, let me back up, is it common for a sex assault victim to want to clean themselves right away after being sexually assaulted? It is. So do you ask questions about that when you're dealing with somebody that is reporting this type of activity to you? I do. Did you ask that of this defendant? Yes. Did she indicate um, to you whether she had bathed or showered since the assault occurred? She said yes, she had. What about, um, do you ask about clothing, if they've changed clothing since the assault? I do. What did she say about uh, clothing? That she had changed her clothing and had washed it. When you were having um, interaction with her, um, obviously she'd indicated to you that she had bathed slash showered. Uh, did she appear to have bathed and showered? No, she didn't. Why do you say no, she didn't? Um, just based on my observations, her hair was very greasy, so it did not appear to have been for her to have showered recently. Okay. Okay. Am I? Yeah. I'm okay. Are you, are you, do you get a little nervous when you testify? Or is the chair giving you trouble? No, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, during your whole interaction with her, was she able to make eye contact with you and communicate regularly? She was. She gave you any indication that would cause you to think she wasn't understanding what was happening? No, she did not. Does she give you a, a long description of uh, the alleged attack that she um, is saying that she suffered? No, she did not. Okay. Well, when you're going through the, um, let me pull this particular page up. The FNE history, um, do you remember writing that? I do. Do you put a longer quote of hers that's a direct quote because of quotation marks as to what she said specifically about the sex assault? Yes. Do you remember that specific longer quote as you sit there today? I would have to look at it again. Okay. Um, to refresh your to memory? To refresh my memory or to be able to say specifically what that said. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. And for the record, this is for, pagination 480053.
Did that refresh your memory? And yes. to get it word for word, would it be easiest for you to actually read the quote itself? It would. Um, go ahead and read that particular quote. And, and let me be clear, is this a quote that's coming directly from you to her and this is verbatim what she told you? It is, yes. Okay, go ahead and read I ask, I ask specifically for the patient to tell me what happened to her and her body during the assault. Okay, and what did she tell you in response to that? So she said, so I don't know any other way to explain it. He was waiting in our home and, sorry, um, any other way to explain it. He was waiting in our home and he grabbed me. Well, it was leading up to all of that. He grabbed me and pushed me down in my son's room. I was kind of like fighting back um, because he wasn't much bigger than me, you know. Then at that point, he just started forcing himself on me and taking off my pants. He didn't never take off my shirt, but I was saying no. And I remember like a little bit of my back started hurting and my head was hitting the floor, the concrete. Then I could tell that he, you know, like I could tell that I had to give in, just basically give up. All right. Let me retrieve that from you. As a result of that particular description, um, were you able then to do a physical exam of the defendant to see if there were any injuries, such as she said she was hitting her head on the concrete? That was, yep, yeah, part of the exam. Um, did you in fact do that physical exam of this particular defendant? I did, according to the search warrant. Okay, did you take photographs of that? I did. I put on there, or I handed you earlier, People's Exhibits 340 through 353. Can you go ahead and flip through those and let me know when you're done? Did you have a chance to look through those? Yes. What are those photographs? Um, photos that I took. Of this defendant? Of, on, correct. On January 29th, 2020? Yes. Okay. Are they fair and accurate representations as to what you saw uh, when you were doing this physical exam of her on that date? Yes. All right, I move for admission of 340 through 353 and permission to publish. No objection. 340 through 353 will be admitted. Go ahead. And Ms. Van Nest, there's obviously the two screens there. If it's easier for you as we're going through these, um, you can just look at the, the photos in front of you or you can turn around and point things out on the uh, actual exhibits on the screens too. Is that okay? Yeah. If you want to look at the screens, there's a pointer there in the, in the uh, witness stand somewhere. So we're looking at People's Exhibit 340. Um, were there, is this how she looked on January 29th? Yes, yeah, so this would have been my initial photograph. We do... Um, an, an initial photograph to say, yes, this is, this is who we are taking photos of. Are there any injuries apparent on this particular photo that would um, corroborate what she's saying happened to her two days prior? No. Um, people's 341. Looks like just a left side profile. That is correct. Any apparent injuries uh, on her at that time that would corroborate what she told you that happened two days prior? No. People's 342, is this right side profile? Yes. Are there any apparent injuries on her right side profile that would corroborate what she told you happened two days prior? No. 344, uh, what, is this the back of the head essentially? Yes. Um, did you see any, any injuries that would corroborate um, soreness to the back of her head that she was reporting to you? I did not. Did you feel any lumps? I did not. Any bruising apparent? No. Any blood? No. Um, in this particular photo, do you see any injuries that would corroborate what she told you occurred two days prior? No. Um, 340, what number am I in? 44? 344, thank you. This top of head? Yes. Again, same questions. Any apparent injuries in this photo that would corroborate what she told you occurred two days prior? No. Any lumps or swellings or blood or bruising? None that I noted. No. Um, 345. It's a close up of that same scalp. 
Is this a close-up of the of the? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, any again any injuries noted in the the picture of her close-up of the scalp that would corroborate what she told you two days prior? No. Um, Three forty-six. Is it typical for you to take a look at their hands? Um, in this case, per the search warrant, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, as we're looking at, uh, I assume these are Letitia's hands sitting on a table in front of her. That is correct. Were there any injuries apparent on her on the backs of her hands that were would corroborate what she told you occurred two days prior? Um, I had noted abrasions and um, a bruise to the her hands. Okay. Those are not necessarily, well, can you see any of those in this particular photograph? I can see an abrasion on her left hand. So point that out using that pointer. Is it sometimes, uh, can it be difficult to determine age of an abrasion on somebody's skin like that? Yes. Can you tell whether something is more fresh or older, generally speaking? It gets... <laughs> Um, yes and no. Um, it's hard for me. Everybody is so different um, in how they heal and how um, injuries present on somebody. So it is, it's really hard for me to say, um, you know, how long an injury has been there. Okay. Let's go on to 347. This appears to be right hand with palm down on the desk. Is that right? That is correct. Do you see any injuries on this photo that would corroborate what she told you occurred two days prior? I see an injury on her um, pinky. Okay, Here. point that out. So sort of the inside um, along the edge of the nail? That is correct. 348. What are we looking at in 348? We are looking at a pinpoint abrasion. What can cause a pinpoint abrasion like that? Um, so an abrasion is just... <laughs> Essentially, it's another word for a scrape. Um, so just a superficial injury. So um, scraping it on a surface, um, even scratching, those types of things can cause that. Okay. 349. I'm sorry. Is that 349 that we have? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see any apparent injuries in people's 349? I do. Point that out for the jury and describe what we're looking at. Um, I also noted this to be an abrasion as well. Um, and I believe she reported that her dog had bit her there. Okay, so point that out and tell what finger and sort of general yes. area of the finger. Yes, so that would be her middle finger um, at the first knuckle, second, second knuckle. Middle finger of right hand. Thank you, yes. Palm up, and then what about the dot on the uh, finger pad of that same finger that wasn't an injury that i noted um if it was an injury i would have noted it in my record okay and then what's our next number 350 thank you so this now appears to be left hand that is correct um point out any injuries that you see in people's 350 i see an abrasion in between her pinky and her ring finger on the knuckle area? On the knuckle area, on her left hand, palm down. 351. Is that just a close-up of that? That same is area? a close-up at the same spot. 352. That is a close-up with our measurement tool that we use. So we really documented that one very we well. <laughs> we did. 353. What are we looking at there? We are looking at another abrasion, um, also on the left hand um, here. So that at the base of the index finger uh, below the knuckle, essentially. Thank you. Yes. So as we're looking through those photographs, um, the only potential injuries that you were able to note on this defendant, were they only on her hands area? Um, that was the only area that was um, specified in the search warrant. I wasn't able to assess the rest of her body. Okay. So, but as it relates to these photos, none on her head that would corroborate her head being hit on concrete. That is correct. And then the only other injuries are on hands, both front and back. That is correct. 
How many patients have you seen um, during your career as a forensic nurse examiner? Um, roughly 600 around there. Mr. Allen, could yes. you find a reasonable breaking point in the next five minutes? Or yes, absolutely, minutes? Judge. Um, how many people have you had leave um, before they finished with the, the SANE exam? Just a handful, not very many. Have you worked with patients who were suffering from some sort of mental health issue that they could not give informed consent to undergo this invasive uh, procedure? I have. How many times has that happened? Um, I would say a handful of times as well. I don't have a specific number. Was there at any point in your interaction with this defendant that you had any concerns about her mental condition that she was unable to understand things? No, I did not. Did she give you informed consent to undergo this exam that she then didn't participate in? She did. What happens if you are interacting with somebody that is so severely mentally diseased or defective um, that they can't uh, give informed consent and they're potentially a danger to themselves or others? What would you do? Um, I would notify the emergency room physician. Is there a procedure for that? There is. What is that called? Um, so the emergency room physician, if they were concerned, I would let them know about that and they could place the patient on it, what's called an M1 hold to be evaluated by a mental health evaluator. Meaning that if somebody was so diseased and defective that they're a danger to themselves or others, that they can't voluntarily leave. Correct. Did this defendant ever get anywhere close to that in your interactions with her? No. What is your lay opinion as to whether Letitia Stouck on January 29th was uh, sane? I'm, your Honor, I'm going to object under people being the uh, This witness does not have the foundation to say whether or not she's I understand. I'm going to allow her to uh, provide her testimony. I think uh, she's had, she does have some expertise. She, so, she does have some ability to, or has had some ability regarding other patients, so I'm going to allow overrule. What is your opinion as to her sanity? Um, I believe she was sane and consentable to my exam at the time that I um, saw her. And this would have been two days after uh, her stepson went missing and she was purportedly sexually assaulted. That is correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Cross examination. Do you have any training in forensic psychiatry? I do not. Did you try to do any type of mental examination on Ms. Stouck? No, I did not. Would you be competent as far as medical training to do any type of mental examination? I am um, competent in terms of assessing them um, for consentability to doing my exam sure. or if there needs to be further involvement by a, a doctor. But you're not trained to diagnose mental health issues? That is correct. No further questions. Redirect. No, I don't think so, Judge. All right. Um, do any of the jurors have any questions for this witness? All right. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Watch your step when you step off the stand. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have our evening recess. Uh, again, don't discuss a case among yourselves. Don't discuss a case with anyone else. Don't do your own independent research about any aspect of the case. Um, if uh, we can have you all back where you uh, normally meet in the morning uh, so that we can start at, uh, we should be able to start right on time at nine o'clock. Um, and you'll need to leave, uh, leave yourself, easy for me to say, you'll need to let yourselves out the door uh, as Mr. Combs is not here. So uh, juror number 10 in the front, uh, if you wanna lead the way out the door and just everybody else follow her. All rise for the jury, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Um, 
I wanted to make a uh, little further record regarding uh, the objection that was made at the bench with respect to um, uh, the defendant leaving the hospital uh, before uh, having the SANE examination done. And the testimony, as I heard it and as I understood it, is that in this case, uh, the SANE examination was a voluntary process that came across very clearly that some uh, uh, people decide not to undergo it and some people um, uh, go ahead and proceed with it. There was a claim, I suppose, uh, that maybe she was supposed to have a SANE exam ordered. That did not come out through the testimony. What came out through the testimony was a 411 order uh, requesting buckle swabs, blood, and fingernail scrapings. And um, I understand the argument was that her leaving before having something done uh, pursuant to a warrant uh, may comment on her, uh, on the defendant's right to remain silent. First of all, uh, the only warrant that has been uh, discussed in any detail at all is the 411 order. Secondly, the defendant does not have a right uh, to refuse that. Um, as we all know, she could have been held down to have the 411 order executed. Um, so I don't think it comments uh, on her right to remain silent um, because for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, that order is to be executed whether it's with or without the defendant's cooperation. And number two, as nearly as I can tell, it appears that it was. Um, so the testimony here is that the defendant left without having a SANE examination done, which by the testimony that I've heard is voluntary. Um, and I've not heard anything else regarding that. So I just wanted to make that further record. Um, is there anything else that we need to address at this point in time, prosecution? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Uh, defense? Your Honor, I want to make a further record on the lay witnesses offering opinion regarding sanity or insanity and the specific legal terms of mental defect um, with it. And I'm referring, of course, to people the Medina. Does the statute allow it? It does. But there must be an adequate foundation laid by the specific witness. Before such opinion, and this is a quote from Medina, and that is 521 PGD 1257, Colorado Supreme Court, 1974. Before such opinion, evidence from a non expert can be admissible. The specific facts upon which the opinion is based must be first stated by the witness, and his testimony must show a close or intimate relationship with the party alleged to be insane. Such foundation is fair and reasonable requirement for a non-expert's opinion on the issue of sanity and competency to stand trial. Your Honor, I think the lay witnesses can testify whether they observed anything unusual, whether they observed what they observed, but them giving an opinion about whether or not she suffered a mental disease or defect or was sane or insane, they have to have the proper foundation in order to be able to do so. All right. Mr. Allen, do you have a response? Your Honor, I think the statute's clear. I think what has happened so far, there's been some foundation laid with the witnesses, at least with the time that they spent with Ms. Stout, and they can develop their opinions. Yeah, I, I just think that, um, and what I have instructed the jury on on more than one occasion is that a layperson uh, or someone who even may be an expert, but not uh, classically trained psychologist or psychiatrist is not gonna be able to give a DSM-4 or DSM-5 uh, diagnosis, um, but they can give a lay opinion based on, this is what I saw, this is how she reacted, this is what she did, this, these were my perceptions. Um, I didn't see any of those kinds of things um, I do think that that's appropriate, um, and I've given the jury a limiting instruction regarding all of those, uh, I think more than once, saying that they cannot give an opinion uh, based on a DSM-4 diagnosis, but there's a difference between a DSM-4 diagnosis and what um, a layperson may be perceiving, but that doesn't discount the layperson's opinion about a defendant's mental state um, 
when they are observing the defendant and what those facts are based on. So you've made your record and I've made my ruling and uh, we'll move on. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Okay. And if um, uh, maybe I can work on a uh, further limiting instruction or something like that. Uh, but it seems to me, I, I mean, I've already told the jury, I, I think the issue here is that there, we already know what it is between the uh, psychiatrists, right? I mean, the law has a legal definition of what sanity is, and psychology and psychiatrists have a psychological definition of what insanity is, and those aren't necessarily the same thing. It's this, it, and as I see this, it's the same with a lay person that may have an opinion about whether someone is insane or is not insane, but that's not necessarily the same thing as the legal definition, nor is it the same thing as the psychological definition and under a DSM-4. And I understand what the court is saying, just to make record. I, I, I think there is a difference between um, when a doctor testifies or when um, even Dakota Stout testifies who have an ongoing long right. relationship with her versus these witnesses who have, you know, 30, 40, 50, Action with her, then making these. I don't think under me that maybe not being clear that they do not have the foundation to be able to say sane or insane. I think they can comment on what they've observed, but as far as making an overall opinion that they're sane or insane, I think maybe is saying they do not have the foundation. Okay. All right. And what does tomorrow look like? Judge, we'll start out tomorrow morning with a witness that's going to probably take. The balance of the morning, it'll be uh, former detective Jess Bethel, and then okay. get into some crime scene start with uh, an expert in the afternoon. Okay. The impression that I get, and I'm not, I'm not trying to jinx anything. Well, but I the think I jinxed us by saying what I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed that, um, but I the impression that I get is that things are going perhaps faster than what you had anticipated, um, and you are making it through witnesses. Um, uh, quickly, um, I and uh, I understand that uh, all of that may change um, once we get to the psychologists and those sorts of things. Um, but are we are we about where you thought you would be ahead behind? Uh, I I think it's pretty clear that we are ahead of schedule. Um, okay. But as you noted, we will start to hit slower witnesses. Right. We still have some pretext phone calls that we are going to be playing with a couple of different witnesses. We have the defendant's interview, for instance. Um, initial interview is tomorrow. That's about four, almost five hours of interview. We have another one with a- Are you gonna play the whole thing? Yes. Yep. Um, find a reasonable breaking point for that. It sounds like probably we will need to take a lunch break somewhere in there. Yeah. Just find a reasonable breaking point. Yeah, yep. So I think you're right, Judge, that there we are gonna hit a point where we're probably gonna hear from less witnesses throughout a right. particular day. But I do think we're ahead of where we thought we would be. Okay. The other thing that uh, probably you know you need to be mindful of, especially since it came up with um, Mr. Young playing the um, video, I, when we get done with all of this, we need a clean laptop that works for everything. Yep. So um, just be mindful of that. Yep. Okay. Anything from the defense? Okay. All right. Court will be in recess then.